네, 잠시. 네, 잠. 아. 네, 잠시 안내 말씀드리겠습니다. 곧이어. Let me give you a housekeeping announcement. We will begin the session one very soon, so I ask all of you to come into the venue and be seated. Session one will begin in short time, so please be seated. Expo 2030, where all countries will agree to cooperate and act on the great transition to an era of sustainability. Busan, Korea, a World Expo 2030 candidate city, will open a sustainable future for humanity and planet Earth. Korea. A country that made the impossible possible. Korea, which was receiving aid, has been transformed into a developed country. And remarkably advanced from one of the world's poorest countries to a developed country in just a little more than a half century. The world's 10th largest economy. A leader in the fourth industrial revolution with innovative technologies. And home of highly valuable global brands. This is Korea. At the center of Korea's economic growth, there is Busan. From a shelter for war refugees to a cradle for future industries of the world and Korea, Busan has played a key role in driving national economic growth. A World Expo 2030 candidate city, Busan, Korea, will be a bridge between developing and developed countries for understanding and coexistence. Busan, Korea is setting a new global standard for soft power. The courage of journalists who did not turn a blind eye to the truth has led to... Korea is widely recognized for its soft power in many areas, including press freedom. Parasite. And Korean culture. Busan is at the epicenter of Korean soft power. It is a city of K-content, culture that represents Korea and is emerging as a global hub of arts and culture for the future. Busan, Korea hopes to extend the value and share the experience of soft power with the world through World Expo 2030. A gateway city connecting Eurasia and the Pacific and the world by sea and sky a center of global logistics and cultural exchange, a beloved marine tourism city, and a favorite of the mice industry. In 2030, a new future of humanity and planet Earth will unfold. A great transformation where dreams come true and despair turns into hope begins here in Busan, Korea. Sustainable living with nature, technology for humanity, and platform for caring and sharing all start here. Busan, Korea will take the lead at the forefront of transformation to a brighter future. Transforming our world, navigating toward a better future. World Expo 2030, Busan, Korea. We want to host the Busan Expo 2030, and we are all wanting that to happen. And now we will begin session one. And before that, I would like to introduce the participants. First, uh, the ambassador of Netherlands to ROK. Please welcome her with a big round of applause. 네, 감사합니다. 네, 그리고 잠시 통역... uh, and we also provide simultaneous interpretation service for today's conference. You can use the receiver in front of you. Channel 1 is for Korean and 2 for English. 
Thank you. And now we would like to begin session one of the Global Conference for Women in Maritime. This conference is being held in Busan and is live streamed on YouTube as well. We have English and Korean channels on YouTube. And we are also taking real-time questions from the participants and the audience. So please leave any comment if you want. So we are going to start the session one that is about the Mar women in maritime and safety. So the chair of the session is Professor Kim In Hyun of Korea University. The professor is a maritime law expert and has worked with the IMO Legal Committee and was the chair for the Korean Maritime Law Mediation Promotion Committee. He's nurtured over 20 lawyers with a ship engineering background, leading the foundation for the growth of the Korea's maritime industry. And this year, he was also featured on a TV show you kids on the block highlighting the importance of shipping business and seafarers so now we would like to invite the professor please welcome him with a big round of applause good afternoon i am Kim In Hyun, Captain and Professor Kim In Hyun. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, good to see you. And at the Global Conference for Women in Maritime 21, we are now embarking the first journey. And with CEO Lee Bong Sun, we are here on the same boat. So, the session one is about the women in maritime and safety and under the topic we will talk about the impacts and responses of the safety on the global logistics so in this session we will share the importance of the safety and in the following sessions we'll talk about how women can play bigger roles and how we can really um, help more women to join the maritime industry for a safe operation. So we have two um, great women presenters. So first um, presenter is from Egypt, CEO Iman Yehia. She um, earned her BA in English Literature from Alexandria University, and she started export business for Holti Culture. And since 2005, she has been uh, running a lesson bot for expert after starting her uh, own company, and she has been learning um, running uh, many landscape project and at this conference she will talk about the role of the logistics for successful trade so so uh, for successful trade in business you need to work with good shipping lines that's what she will talk about and now she's joining us from Egypt um, live real time so Floor is yours, CEO Iman Yehia. Hello. Thank you very much for the presentation. Oh yes, oh, you I'm, have floor I, for fifteen minutes. I'm, yes, uh, I'm. I'm joining you from from Egypt, Alexandria, especially, and I'd like to give you an idea about how logistics is very important in export in general, or in doing business in export or import. Because uh, uh, if, you, if you succeed in doing uh, good uh, or dealt with good shipping line, uh, this will keep your uh, cargo safe and in good condition till it arrives to the client. Uh, out of experience uh, uh, in dealing with uh, shipping lines, for example, for cargoes like stones or something like this, uh, there is no problem with the transit time or uh, how good is the uh, shipping line or uh, handling the logistics in taking time, long time or short time, it doesn't make a difference. 
but with the uh, landscape and the plants, trees and so on, uh, it's completely different. So uh, uh, I must look for a good uh, transit time, good shipping line and shortest transit time for, uh, uh, for the export. Uh, because, uh, you know, plants doesn't take a long time as uh, to be alive for a long time. So it needs to arrive to the landscape project live and in a good condition. Out of experience, I'd like to uh, advise you uh, that you must check uh, for the shipping lines and uh, don't uh, uh, get fascinated and impressed by the, the brand names and so on. Because out of experience, I'll explain to you a situation happened with me once. Uh, I had a shipment of seven containers to uh, to Spain, and uh, uh, unfortunately, the shipping line, I don't want to mention the name, uh, but in a way, uh, this shipping line made me lose the, the client completely and uh, destroyed a part of my business. Why? Because, you know, when the, con the containers arrived to the, uh, to the client, they didn't arrive at one shipment as they are shipped in, in one shipment and in the invoice, and the, the bill of loading, they are seven, okay? What happened that they arrived to the client, two containers only, and then within a month, another two, and then another three okay. in different times. So by this way, the client paid a lot of money for uh, uh, waiting till all the seven containers arrived together, one time to take them out of port and finish their documents before they are one shipment, not several ones. So this made me lose the client and he also lost money and I lost money. So what I suggest to you all, okay, so take care of uh, uh, the shipping lines, uh, the transit time, this is very important. How would the, 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 the company that is handling the logistics for you, this is important, very, very important. 50% on your uh, effort and on your products and the other 50% that will make your uh, business succeed in the logistic, especially the shipping ports. This is very important, whether by airplane or by, by vessel, but I concentrate on the vessel because this is uh, the worst thing in the whole business that can make you succeed or make you lose a lot of money and a lot of clients. So what I suggest, take care of your business, take care of handling logistics. This is very important. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm very glad to be with you and join this conference. Thank you, and I welcome I answering any question you may have any time. Thank you so much, and nice to join you. Thank you. Thank you for the great uh, remark. Please give her a big round of applause once again. Well, that was a quick presentation, in fact, but still very thank you. So I can say that 50% of your success rely on the logistics, as doctor said. So logistics is really important and crucial, and I hope that we can have more female talents in the field. And now we are going to invite the second speaker of the session, that is Ms. Gloria Choi, that is Vice President of Busan Newport, and she is also working with the DP World. DP World is the world's largest port operator in the world. That is a Air UAE company and DP World is in charge of operating the new Busan port, so she is working with the DP World and basically Busan New Port. So she has been working in this field for over 25 years, and from 2015, she is in charge of operating PNC Busan New Port, and she is now the vice president of PNC and PNC. adopted lashing cage and a sleep detection device for um, yard tractor in order to promote safety culture in Nipusan port. 
So their safety management culture is well received by the international community and the maritime community as well. So she's to going to talk about some blockage in the logistics industry as well, including the Suez Canal uh, blockage accident. So we will be learning a lot of things about the logistics from the vice president. So now I would like to invite Ms. Glory Choi for her presentation. Please welcome her with a big round of applause. Hello. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Gloria Choi, Chief Operating Officer and Vice President of Busan New Port Company Limited. It is my honor to be here Global Conference for Women in Maritimes 2021. And I would like to share with you our safety journey. According to the World Economic Forum, our economy relies on shipping containers. Today, an estimated 90% of the world cargoes are transported by sea. That's also explained maritime safety is really critical to global supply chain and trade. Incidents like sweep canal blocking, COVID-19, extreme weather and Beirut explosion created unprecedented disruption to global supply chain. Despite COVID-19 pandemic, we observe the resilience of shipping industry. The global volumes declined only by around 3.6% last year. However, cruise industry and car carrier segment have much adverse impact by the pan pandemic. Watertight demand capacity constraint and also ongoing impact of COVID-19 caused serious port congestion and destruction to supply chain. For example, as you learned, the outbreak of COVID-19 in China, the port culture of Yantian and Ningbo has tremendous impact on the delays causing the congestion all over the world. So we also observe a ripple effect on problems in one region can spread around the world. With the restriction on travel and border, there is a significant impact on the cruise change arrangement. And actually extended periods working on sea can lead to mental fatigue, which ultimately impacts safety as unseaworthy under international maritime law. So investigation of the Wakashio incident found at least two crews working on board over a year and unable to disembark even after contract expiry. The recovery is wartime and dependence on the success of vaccinations and the ongoing effects of the pandemic. Nowadays, there is a trend of building larger container ships, car carriers, and bulk carriers for economy of scale and fuel efficiency. However, it, imp it imposes unique risk as most of our existing terminal development cannot catch up such upsize trends. 
Responding to incident become more complex and expensive. The blocking of the three canals by ever given caused huge delays to hundreds of vessels awaiting to transit there. An estimated impact represents around 12% of total global volume, global trade. In addition, the climate change and also caused destruction to international shipping, devastating explosion at the port of Beirut and Tianjin raised industrial concerns over the storage of hazardous cargoes and concentration of risk at ports. Fires on board vessel also increased significantly in recent years, which can be result of poor decoration of hazardous cargoes, which affect the packing and storage location on board. Fire incident on board Express Pearl caused the ship sinking in Sri Lanka, resulting not just only loss of cargo, but also a significant impact on environmental pollution. Let me share with you how we drive safety improvement at DP World. About DP World, we are the world's leading provider of smart logistic solutions. We help trade flow across the globe. Innovation is in our DNA. Our comprehensive range of products and services touches every aspect of life. We operate multiple businesses, from ports and terminal to economic zones, logistic and marine services. We think ahead, anticipate change, and deploy industry-leading technology to create the smartest, most efficient, and innovative trade solutions, while ensuring a positive and sustainable impact on economies, societies, and our planet. Our global network spans across 181 country, uh, business units in 64 countries across six continents. Our dedicated, diverse, and professional team of more than 56,000 employees are committed to bringing and growing and, and to bringing every customer and partner unrivaled values. We do this by building and growing long-lasting relationship with government, shippers, traders, and other stakeholders along the global supply chain. As a global logistic leader, DP World enables smarter trade to create a better future for everyone. DP World's Our World, Our Future Sustainability Strategy guides our approach, which aligns with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It helps us to work in a responsible way that prioritizes sustainability and impact on the people, communities, and environment in which we operate. Our world is ever changing. At DP World, we know that by looking after the important things, unlike our people, safety, our environment, and our society, we'll also be looking after the future of our business. So, we are taking a global approach to do this. It's called Our World, Our Future. And the journey has already begun. Our people are our greatest asset. So we want everyone at DP World to be safe and happy at work. Our global My World survey gives everyone a chance to have their say. To help us make decisions about important commitments. Like creating a diverse and inclusive workplace. We provide personal development opportunities for our people. Wherever they work. Through our DP World Institute. We protect our people.
We ensure the highest safety standards. Aiming for zero harm. We give them the best training in things like emergency response and accident investigation. We know that protecting our future also means we protect our environment. Every day, by using more sustainable fuel like biodiesel. By increasing our use of solar power. By supporting the next generation of environmental leaders through our Carbon Ambassador Program. We are working with communities all over the world for Go Green Week. On everything from recycling to climate change. We are building stronger societies wherever we operate. Using local suppliers. And creating jobs. We focus on issues that really matter to our people. Male cancer awareness. Education and teaching the next generation about trade. And disaster relief all over the world. Our last Global Volunteer Week helped over 7,000 people in 19 countries. We like to work collaboratively with all our stakeholders. We make partnerships and share our best practice. To create a bigger impact. And we will deliver on our promise. By constantly innovating, measuring, reporting and improving. We're building a stronger business for our customers, our people, our society, and our planet. At DP World, we know that by working together and working sustainably, we can change our world and our business for the better. We are operating Pusan New Port Company here. Busan New Port Company is the largest terminals in Korea, providing world-class services to our customers and leading on safety, operations, efficiency, and technology advancement. The company was first established in 1997 and commenced in operations in 2006. Last year, it was our fourth year achieving annual container throughput over 5 million TEUs. Safety is always our prime focus. We believe only with a safe operation, we could improve operation efficiency. We apply the health, safety, environment pillars to all our activities with vision to eliminate serious injury and fatalities. The HSE pillar are in leadership and engagement, risk reduction and improvement, as well as commitments we live by. We cultivate a culture of zero harm to ensure people go home safe. The environment is protected and enhanced wherever possible. We continually improve our business practice and standards in compliance with several international standard lists here. Here is the sharing of one of our employees several years ago. My name is Jong-won, I'm 38 years old. I live in Busan, in Gamcheon. I live in Gamcheon. ジオ・ナコディアトンジオ・ヨスナ、チェグンチュミンデレ・ノリョグロ、モチンゴスロ・ピョンモハヤスミダ。チェグネン・ドウ・マンン・コンガネ・トリ・チャコ・イスミダ
which allow us to implement safety and integrate easily into the day-to-day -day business functions. Several safety initiatives were introduced firstly at PNC and later become market practice in the industry. So you can see from the, from the screen a few initiatives that has been well implemented in Busan Port. And other terminals are now heading also follow the best practices. This is also our commitment to share the best practices when we talk about the safety improvement. To cultivate a strong safety culture, we proactively engage with our stakeholders in the community on solutions. So we are not just only driving safety with our staff, but we also engage with our subcontractors, our stakeholders. We always have the meeting and interaction, look for the solutions. And this helped the whole community, the industry, raise the safety awareness. We are committed to raise safety awareness of all people. And it is not just only at work, but also at our daily lives to create a better future. This is one of our safety campaign with employee family last year. Let's save together. This year, as of now, we have achieved zero injury in our terminal. Our efforts and achievements on safety improvement have been well recognized in local community, as well as globally at DP World. Thanks to our people who are committed to create a better future and safe workplace together. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation on preventing drivers from getting um, dizzy or sleepy. And this whole campaign uh, was very impressive. And once again, please give a big round of applause for the great presentation. Thank you very much. 
and moving on we will have the panel discussion so after arranging the stage we're gonna invite two panelists first panelist is scott rich captain and the managing director of wilhelmsman ship management he obtained his master marina license and degree in nautical studies from the maritime university of the united kingdom and he has worked in various sectors of the maritime industry um, for 45 years he is an expert and he may have a lot of things to say about the safety and um, the wilhelmsman ship management manages a lot of um, freight um, owned and chartered vessels and operating um, around the world and it's a global company and for the session he's here in person so we're going to invite him in a few minutes and we also have another panelist who is mr lee uh, mr jacob lee um, from samsung scds he's the principal professional logistics contract group um, he um, earned a doctorate in laws from Korea University and now he has been working in the industry like Samsung SDS and Hanjin Shipping for 26 years. Now he's responsible for all the logistics of the Samsung SDS as a group leader and he's also a director of the Korea Maritime Law Association and also a member of the Korea Maritime Forum. So now uh, I think the tr uh, table and the seatings are now being arranged. So we're going to invite the moderator and the panelist to the stage. Um, just wait for a few seconds. I'm sorry. And it's almost done. So please welcome them with a big round of applause. So once again, let me invite them, the moderator and the two panelists and the speaker. Please come up to the stage. It's um, so please welcome them with a big round of applause. Okay, so now let me turn it over to the moderator. Hello. So again, I'm here on the stage, so I'll be the moderator of today's session. So yes, we have great speakers for the session. We listened to two presentations earlier, and we have two male experts for our panel discussions as well. So the first topic is about the ship management company. Well, there are many ship management companies and Wilhelmsen Ship Management is a very famous farm. So the Captain Scott Litch is with us, so we are going to invite him for his remark. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, as you heard in the introduction, I've been in the maritime industry for 45 years since I was a young man. Uh, I spent a lot of time in various parts of the world working in various parts of the maritime industry and I could not be more pleased, could not be more pleased to be involved in the encouragement of more women coming into the maritime industry. Traditionally, traditionally it's a very male dominated industry of course, um, but once again I'm absolutely 101% sure that uh, especially today uh, and moving into the future uh, that there is no aspect of the maritime industry, no aspect at all, uh, that women cannot compete with men on an absolutely equal footing and do as good, in many cases, a better job in actual fact. Uh, we may discuss that a little bit later. Anyhow, uh, ship management, I've been asked to tell you a little bit about ship management. So, uh, ship management, uh, this is a, very often, primarily, uh, ship managers are, are third parties. They manage ships for owners. That is to say, owners will uh, purchase the ships and then they do not want to employ all of the experts that it takes to uh, have the ships conduct their business and move around the world themselves. So they outsource. They outsource this to uh, specific companies that engage in this. And this is what a ship manager does. A ship manager provides the experts, the engineers, the navigators, 
and the administrators, and there are just as many administrators as, as uh, ex seagoing staff, um, they, they, pro they provide the expertise to keep the ship moving from port to port around, around the world. Uh, and a ship manager will very often, very often manage ships for several owners, not just for one owner, but for several owners. And the benefit of that, of course, is that uh, the owner, owner can concentrate on uh, the commercial aspect of, of his shipping operation, making sure that the, the cargo that is, is booked by usually their, com their own commercial department is handled on ships that are uh, well certificated, well maimed and well crewed by, by uh, the crew that, that, that are on board. Uh, and that they, don't, they, can, they don't have to worry about this. They're, they're, they're essentially business people. Uh, and they will, they will outsource this to the third party company. And another significant benefit of that, of course, is economy. Of economy. Uh, for every ship owner to hire captains, chief engineers, administrators, electricians, etc., is, is quite an expensive undertaking. So if you can concentrate all this expertise within one company, your ship manager, your ship manager, and that ship manager can provide a higher level of uh, service and skill at a lower cost and perhaps the owner could do it for himself. If a ship owner is a, a substantial company such as Hyundai Merchant Marine here in Korea for example, they literally have hundreds of ships and, and they, they're quite able and do manage ships in-house themselves. But for the smaller owner that may have um, 10, 20, even one ship, there are some owners that operate just one ship, then the ship manager is, is an ideal solution uh, for, the, for these owners, where they can get economy of scale and, and, and the benefit uh, of having their ships managed by a group of experts that do just that and, uh, and only that. So the ship manager's role is um, to make sure that uh, the ship has the crew on board, all of the crew are certificated and experienced in, in the type of ship that they're operating. Uh, make sure that the ship is certificated as you can imagine, like everything else in the world today, um, safety is, is paramount. It is absolutely paramount. And part of that is to make sure that every little piece of machinery on board is certificated. Uh, even small minute parts of machinery uh, have individual certificates. And that these certificates are all in order, that the ships are, and the equipment are regularly inspected and maintained to a minimum standard. Uh, and, and the ship manager will, will, will take care of that. Um, and thereafter, the, uh, the ship manager will coordinate with the owner to make sure that he understands where the ship needs to be, Busan, shall we say, to start. And then as the ship sets off on its, on its commercial voyage, then the commercial department will advise the captain on board uh, where, to, where to take the ship to next. Uh, and the ship manager will monitor to make sure that all the goods and services that are required to keep the ship running in operation are... Uh, organized and in place at the various ports around the world. Uh, so this essentially is what, the, what, the, what, what a ship manager does. It provides a concentrated uh, center of excellence to a, to a ship owner uh, for a competitive price, essentially. Yeah, so I think that's pretty much in a nutshell what a ship manager is, uh, Captain Kim. Thank you so much. Scott, uh, Scott, the Sanjan, and Mr. Scott Rich is working with the ship management company, and she, he just explained the role of ship management company in the industry. And the speakers and the panelists of today's session are really important people and I believe that the Dr. Iman Ihia from Egypt well let's say that we are exporting a product from Egypt so let's say that we put some goods on board and that is going to the United States Washington port or like LA port then it should be moved by 
this vessel. And from there, it has to use the inland transportation. So if it reaches the Washington, D.C., it needs to get to the department store. And in the end, it needs to complete its last mile delivery for very consumer. So in this long journey, the ship management company plays a very important role in the initial stage because that is to ensure the safety of the important goods that needs to be delivered to consumers in a very far land. And Vice President Gloria Choi, she talked about safe unloading practices at terminals and ports or loading practices as well. And ensuring safety in those areas can be very important as well. So as for this journey from Egypt to the US, for example, well, the vessel moving that good, those goods can go through the Busan port as well. So we all play a very important role in each segment of this journey. So now the next panelist is Dr. Lee jong Dok. He is group lead of Samsung SDS's logistics unit. So he would be in charge of the process after the goods reach the LA port probably. So let's hear what he has to say about this. Thank you for the introduction. And well, first, I have to say that I'm very honored to be in this beautiful city of Busan for this important event. And I'm so happy to see all of you here in the room. Well, I came here from Seoul today. And like Dr. Kim just said, yes, I am responsible for inland transportation. And this session, in particular is about safety in global logistics and a response to safe logistics. So I would like to share some ideas about that. Well, currently we are going through a very prolonged pandemic. It's been over two years. And from a few days ago, we are hearing about new variants like Omicron. So many countries, including the United States, Japan, and the European countries are considering the shutdown measures again. Japan already shut down their country completely. So logistics disruption, well, that's something that we are talking about a lot these days. But does COVID-19 play a very important role in this? Is it the only cause? We don't know. However, if you look at the timeline, at the end of the 20, 2019, we saw the outbreak of the COVID-19, and it became a big issue around the mid March and April. and it became a very serious issue on the western coast of the United States. And it became a serious issue because vessels, well, PSW, that's Long Beach, Auckland, and those areas in the United States. So Long Beach and LA ports couldn't receive vessels. Even when vessels reached the area, they could not park the vessels because they didn't have enough windows in the port first. But the another reason is that containers in this LA Long Beach ports were just mixed up because they were delayed so much inland. And the reason of this delay is that unloading activities were not done properly. When vessels reach the port, unloading activities need to start. However, Long Beach port didn't have enough head and chassis for unloading containers. 
then why did they have this shortage problem all of a sudden? The reason is that there were two issues in the United States last year. Well, we had it here in Korea as well. It's called economic impact payment. That is some sort of, you know, relief, disaster relief. So the United States paid out this EIP three times, $1,200, $600, $1,400 dollars each. However, well, unlike the policymakers' anticipation, people started to use money so much. So they started to buy a lot of things. For example, because people thought that this was just additional money in their pocket. So they increased their consumption. So actually, the shipping industry thought that COVID-19 is going to cause a great halt in their operation. But because of the increased consumption from the United States, the shipping industry became so busy. And this increased consumption caused a stacking of goods inland car inland depot and that became a problem trucks particularly um, transporting imported goods went to the depot and they wanted to unload the goods but the depot and storage was full. So because of all this, they didn't have enough trucks and chassis for loading and unloading. And some old facilities in these ports were just not enough to handle all these increased uh, transportation and volume. And another thing is that due to the pandemic, of course, many laborers died actually that led to the shortage issue of drivers so with the shortage of drivers inland transportation had some problems as well and also inland truck drivers became um, started to work with the Port transportation services as well. However, all this mixed up situation didn't work so well, and that is the reason of the um, logistics disruption. So, what I would like to say is that we can't say that the logistics disruption was caused by the COVID 19, but it did have some impact. And in the end, Some Korean companies exporting goods to the United States through Long Beach port and LA port couldn't deliver their goods in time. Well, the first speaker talked about the delay in shipping first. And this issue is something that we can't really talk about these days. because only less than 10% of vessels reach the destination in the western coast of the United States in time. And the delivery period is about 13 days as of today. And at the Long Beach port, we have 86 vessels being parked and the total value of the goods on board is over three trillion dollars so it is really difficult for them to transport their goods inland in time so exporting companies and cargo owners feel really uncomfortable with the situation Just delay in marine shipping itself is a big concern for them, but inland transportation and delay in inland transportation 
is causing some costs for them as well. And this leads to the issue of demerging. So the well, demerge is not was not really a serious issue in the past because it is just five or ten dollars. However, for one Korean company this time this year, the demerge cost was more than hundred billion won. Well, hundred billion won. You might think that oh, that's a big number. However, if you put it in the context. With the collapse of Hanjin shipping in 2017, the logistics cost loss was about like $230 billion or $250 billion. So that was just less than $300 billion. So the collapse of a big shipping company costed $300 billion won, and the demarage cost was $100 billion. I mean, three hundred billion dollars, and the demerge cost is a hundred billion dollars. So that's a huge amount if you put it into context, and this is a very unprecedented case. So this delay in shipping and demerge, and many other issues need to be handled. So the Biden administration adopted new policy. So he took the presidential order to impose emergency fee for ship liners. So it was introduced in November, but luckily the delaying issue in shipping was eased somewhat in the United States, so they are not moving to the second level of this initiative. But the goal of this initiative is to have ports to quickly move the goods from their terminal. If the goods are stored in the terminal for one month, that fee goes up to like $50,000. And that cost needs to be first borne by shipping lines, which will ultimately be transferred to end consumers or cargo owners. So this means that cargo owners and shippers need to pay not only the demerge but also DLP. So that's a huge issue. So again, I can't say that COVID-19 caused a direct impact on this issue, but it is somewhat related to this. And many people say, experts say that COVID-19 is happening due because we are not safeguarding our planet. So we need to focus on the safety first if we do not want to see these unprecedented um, cases. So this delay in shipping in the United States These issues might not be resolved in near future, probably by the mid-2023. And probably it is possible that we would see another serious event in the future. So we'll probably stop here first. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. And he is also um, in responsible for um, um, he's also working for the Samsung SDS, um, so he knows a lot about this whole congestion and delay in logistics in the U.S. And he talked about what are really causing the delay and congestion. So it's uh, triggered by the COVID-19, and uh, also if we don't really take care of the safety, it will have a huge impact on the um, global trade. So we heard from the uh, panelists, and uh, we have a few minutes left. So from Egypt, Dr. Iman Yehia um, said that she wants to make some comments. So please. You have a floor? 
Yes, sure. Uh, can I can I say uh, just a comment and give one more example uh, of the one uh, for, for about or about shipping from Egypt to uh, you you asked for the USA. No, I'm going to give you another uh, a real example happened with me uh, to export from Egypt to the Netherlands and Teals in South uh, America, which is more far than this destination. You know, the, the vessel takes from 45 to 50 days to, to reach from Alexandria port to Aruba or, or Curacao, uh, any of these uh, two uh, ports. Uh, so the shipping company or the logistics to prove that uh, it's 50% on your success. Uh, now in these two islands, I'm well known there and I am the only exporter from Egypt to these two uh, uh, islands uh, or in this area. Why? Because this shipping line uh, um, handle my shipment in a good way uh, as it takes from 45 to 50 days you know, I prepare the, the, and I export to there the date palm, the palm that gives the fruits for the dates, okay? Uh, so this palm uh, can handle, yes, but not for this uh, long time. So I prepare it well for the root ball and so on. So because the shipping line was uh, accurate and arrives in time, and I did the preparation for this 45 days to 50 days, uh, can you imagine that sometimes the palm arrives giving the fruit, the, the, the small seed, it's uh, still green, but it's a live uh, uh, palm. Uh, the palm arrives in a, in a good condition and giving the new fruit. Can you imagine that? So this made me succeed in these two islands and I am well known there. If you ask it anybody working in the horticulture about El Sindibet for export or about Iji palm, any one of them, they will tell you, okay, Mrs. Iman Yahya from Egypt, yes, we know it, and we get our orders uh, from her only. Uh, one of them, one of the clients uh, wanted to try another company. What happened? He looked for the cheapest service, but at uh, uh, last he got that palm. So uh, for logistics and shipping, he made me succeed 100%. Uh, he completed the 50% of my job. Uh, and I am successful now there. Can you imagine for how long? It's for 11 years because I started my business in 2005. So I started to put my uh, uh, feet on these two islands. Now they know me well. And if they have any order, they contact and they don't trust anybody else except me and uh, my company in Egypt to export to this uh, uh, very far away uh, island because not all the shipping lines go there, only uh, one or two shipping lines uh, that goes to this direction. But in all cases, uh, good preparation and good logistics. This is very important and I put stress on it. This 50%, when it succeeds, it will make you the best exporter or importer in the whole uh, world and they will, it will make your business succeed. If this 50% fail, your work, your whole job and your plans, your money, everything, your reputation also, because in this case, you will lose your, your reputation because they will not say this is because the bad company. No, they will say because this is a bad product. Uh, so this is what I wanted to comment that uh, I wanted to prove how important this point in our business in general, whether in uh, import or export. Thank you very much for taking me your time. Thank you. It, it Thank you very much, Dr. Yehia. Like you said, 50% of the success in trade is by the logistics. So it takes like 45 or 50 days for delivering goods. So yes, that was a great example. And I understand that delivering goods and exporting goods is not easy, but it is very important. So do we have any questions from the floor as well? Anyone? We have about like 10 minutes for the session. So if there's anyone who has some comments or questions, well, I'll give you more time. And I actually have some questions to our panelists. So 
So my question goes to, well, Vice President Gloria Choi earlier said, so Wakashiho Vassal was captivized, capsized earlier, and you mentioned that two crew members were on board for over a year. Well, when I was working as a captain, well, I remember the time that I spent more than 10 months on board. That was really tiring. And because of the COVID-19 now, it is hard to um, change crew members on the ship these days. So as you said, well, there were crew members who were staying on board for too long on the Wakashio vessel. So, well, now I would like to ask Mr. Scott Rich about this matter. So, due to the COVID-19, seafarers find it difficult to take some rest. It is hard, difficult for them to take turns in time. So is it true? And because of this, do you think that they have some increase in their fatigue level? And do you also think that this is also having some impact on the maritime accidents? Um, short answer, yes, <laughs> absolutely. There's absolutely no doubt it's having an impact. Um, the uh, the legal basis is that all seafarers uh, can uh, spend 11 months on board, 11 months. This is the maximum by law. Uh, during this COVID period, we have seen situations where uh, seafarers had to stay on beyond, beyond uh, 11 months, 12 months as the example on the Waikiko incident, of course. Uh, but it's, it has been 14 months in some cases. I don't speak about my own company. Uh, but I know of I know of other instances where seafarers have been on board for as much as, as 14 months. Um, it it isn't all uh, as a result of poor planning uh, or poor logistics uh, on behalf of the owner or indeed the ship manager as, uh, as I am. Um, in many respects, it's, it's been down to uh, national governments closing borders, restrictions around moving. This is this has been. Uh, the, the prime consequence for, for the seafarers being on board uh, longer than is, is allowed by the law. Um, certainly uh, more than 11 months is, is way, too, way too long for any seafarer. I'm sure all of you can understand that anybody going to work in the morning and not coming back for 11 months, that, that's a quite an undertaking, quite an undertaking. And of course the people on board are tired after all that amount of time. Uh, what I would would say, I mean, we're, for those of you that are in the, in the, in the maritime sector, for those of you that are going into the maritime sector, for those of you that are going to encourage people to go into the maritime sector, you're going to be a risk manager, a risk manager. Um, maritime sector, for the most part, is, is about delivering goods from A to B, and ideally, the manufacturer of the goods would like to sell his goods and hand them over to the, the buyer outside the back door of his factory. Uh, the buyer of the goods would like to purchase the goods from the seller and have them appear on his shelves the very next day. In fact, I think it's a fairly uh, popular program. If, if we think about uh, Star Trek, the TV show, the American TV show, what we'd really like to see is goods being dematerialized in, in the factory and rematerialized on the shelves. This is what we'd really like to see. So no matter how good we are in the, in the maritime logistics industry, um, we can never move the goods fast enough and we can never move the goods uh, in a sufficiently cost-effective way. Everybody always wants to see the goods moved faster and at less cost. So as a consequence for that, all of the people, myself and everyone sat here really, uh, we're involved in risk management. Uh, how much risk are we prepared to take to lower that cost uh, of transportation and to speed it up? So uh, this, this essentially is, is, is what, what we're involved in in the maritime sector. And it's true with regard to the seafarers also. Um, my own experience from Europe is that I would work uh, as a junior officer for four months on board. That would be a maximum. 
uh, and latterly as captain on, on passenger ferries, I was working one month at a time, one month on board and one month at home. So for the various uh, shipping countries around the world, um, we, we see, for example, in the US and, and, and Europe, where I come from, where the shorter time that the crew spends on board increases the cost. It increases the cost, of course it does. And ultimately, uh, it's, the, it's the buyer, the, the customers for the goods that are going to pay that cost. This is why, over, over the period of my 40 years in the maritime sector, we've seen that the crewing of vessels has moved gradually to the east. It's, it's, most vessels around the world are crewed by seafarers uh, from Asia. And this is because they're prepared to work on board longer and at less cost. And with that comes risk. So I bring you back to that same point. It's about risk, risk management. What are we as, as, as uh, managers of, of the maritime industry? What is society prepared to accept? The Waikiki, for, for example, we've got this huge um, uh, oil spill taking, taking place in Mauritius, uh, damaging the environment. These gentlemen had been on board for more than a year. Was that risk right? Was it right? Probably not. Um, yeah. A question, something for you to think about. Yeah, uh, Thank you. And it seems like that we have a question from the floor. Thank you very much for your insightful speeches and discussion. And listening to you, I can see that it is not like we are going back to the previous era of this uh, logistics disruption. But I would like to know when we can go back to those previous years. Well, Dr. Lee, could you provide the answer? Sure. Many professionals say that the current logistics congestion is a huge issue, mostly in the United States. And the U.S. spent 500 million, prepared $500 million for funding West Coast port development. But that is the issue for the future. Currently, we have to resolve this congestion right now. And when the world was hit by the financial crisis in 2008, we had this similar issue in the logistics field. But back then, the shipping cost dropped dramatically, causing a lot of difficulties for shipping companies. So going back to the normal stage took about 25 months back then according to various research. So considering the current situation and considering that this is due to, partially at least, uh, by due to the COVID-19, and if the peak was like a year ago, for example, probably we would have to wait for another 20 min months at least so that the current situation free falls and back to go back to the normal stage. However, even when the situations go back to the normal uh, situation, I don't think that we can go back to the previous years of the pandemic. I believe that shipping lines will have a great greater say and a clout in the field in the future. Okay, so I think that I'm going to give the last comment for the session. So yes, the session is about women in maritime and maritime safety. So I would like to know the participation rates of female workers in the field. So we have many experts for the port, ship management, and inland logistics and ter terminal operation. And I am a professor at law school, so at least we have uh, professionals from different five different areas. Then I would like to ask Dr. Imanya here that how many female workers you have in this trade and logistics industry? 
Firstly, three. <laughs> the other are them, uh, because you know the the nature of my uh, job is uh, preparing and uh, dealing with gardeners and so on. But in general, with truck and in the, uh, so on, they need uh, a man. Uh, they will handle it uh, in a better way. Uh, but in general, I have three women uh, out of them. Uh, seven men and three uh, ladies. Uh, two of them are handling logistics. Uh, one of them is handling the shipping with the shipping lines, and the other one is handling uh, the custom clearance and so on. Uh, so everyone has its, uh, her own post. The third one is following up the moving of the cargo and the, the, uh, the farms and the, the plants and the preparation and so on. So they are three out of them. Yeah, come uh, This is a low percentage. And moving on, I would like to ask Gloria Choi the same question. At the moment, we are still having a few percentage in the terminal. And actually, in 2019, we start to have the diversity uh, empower female uh, program in our company. And we also encourage the university student, the female workers. We provide the placement for the for the student to work as a part time in our terminals, and we have a lot of facilities that we tailor for the for, for the female. For example, we have the child care center that our employees can bring the baby, having the baby sitting in in the company, and then they still can work. So we did a lot of uh, an initiative to really attract more female working. And at the moment, we have female working as a remote automated crane operator in our terminals. And they are all females working on run the call. It doesn't matter agenda. So we still have the people encourage uh, female to join this industry. and. Not just only working on the frontline people, but also playing the role on management and executive. So this is also our commitment to have uh, grow up our uh, uh, female in our company. So we have DP World for Women program, and then we have different customized uh, leadership program for female. Thank you very much, and again for Mr. Scott Rich. So 1.25% is women in the maritime industry. That's the ratio. So what about the real health um, or your company? So how many women are working as the seafarer? What? That's what, please. Uh, no, the question is to Scott Rich. Yeah. OK. Um, it, it varies. Uh, what I would probably say between 5 and 10 percent of uh, our crews on board the ship. We have more than a thousand seafarers, 5 to 10 percent on board at that time. What I will say is uh, within the office environment here in Korea, I'm very proud to say that uh, 40, 40 percent of my colleagues in the office are ladies. Uh, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of the ladies that started out uh, on board the vessel they didn't progress through to be captains and chief engineers, but they have moved into the office to, to work with us there. Yeah. So that is for the Wilhelmsen company, so it's a really great. And again, the question goes to Dr. E. jong -dok. What is the female ratio in your company? Well, I would like to talk about the women's participation and proportion in the logistics industry in general. So in the U.S., ship owners are called BOCC, and ship liners without owning the ships are called freeboarders or NBOCC. So you, you two mentioned the uh, proportion at BOCC. And as for the NBOCC, the female workers are about 
which is really fortunate. And the reason for this high percentage is that most of them are working in office and the jobs are really stable. And because they are handling international um, discussions and businesses, uh, which are pretty dy dynamic, um, they can play a very um, helpful role. But however, I believe that we have to raise this proportion or percentage in BOCC as well. We are seeing some collapsing, collapsing barriers between BOCC and NBOCC and commerce and e-commerce. So I expect a higher percentage at BOCC as well. Thank you. Then I would like to make my final comment. I believe that the legal society has a large participation by women. The Korea University Law School's total enrollment capacity is 120 every year. And one year, 70 students were female, which is about 60% of the total capacity. But in most cases, the female-male ratio is about 40 to 60. And in order to become a maritime lawyer, about 40% are female in my school. So in Korea, we have 50 specialized maritime lawyers, and about 40% of them are female. And personally, I have three daughters. And considering my wife, 75% of the family members are female, right? So females are so crucial, and that's the final comment. Thank you so much for participating in this session. Thank you so much. The session one was about female in maritime and maritime safety. That was a great speeches and panel discussion. Thank you so much for moderating the session, Mr. Kim. And we have to move on to the session two, but we are going to take a 10-minute break first. I'll see you again very soon.